It is a wonderful uh, blessing to be here once again this morning to uh, share of God's word to us. Uh, I see that you all look uh, so good this morning. Um, and I see all of you are smiling, so that's good. Before we uh, start our lesson this morning, I just want to invite us to please uh, close your eyes and bow your heads for a word of prayer. Let's invite God to our worship this morning. To the most holy place in heaven, our gracious Father, we humbly bow our hearts and we open them to you this morning. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to descend and fill our hearts today. Father, use me to share the lesson that you want us to, to listen. And may you help our hearts and minds to focus on the great lessons that you want us to learn this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> I have entitled our sermon, our message this morning as the special rock and the memorial stones. Uh, our scripture has already been read this morning. Uh, and thank you, uh, ladies, for reading our scripture this morning. Now, let me uh, read a story to kind of introduce our lesson uh, for us this morning. A man who was uh, accustomed to giving orders and having his own way was traveling to an important meeting was traveling to an important meeting. He decided to take a shortcut and found himself thoroughly lost. Now he asked the, the, the first person he saw, which was a young child, for directions. And this is how the conversation went. Boy, which way to Dover? He gruffly asked. I don't know, the child responded. A little embarrassed. Well then, the man demanded, how far to Brighton? I don't know that either, the child answered. Is there someone around here who can give me directions then? The man raised his voice. I don't know, shrugged the child. The man's uh, questions got more angry as the boy kept responding with the same answer. Finally, the man lost his temper and shouted, Well, you don't know much, do you? Then for the first time, the boy smiled, looking up the winding road to the little house where the evening light grew through the window and where his brothers and sisters played in the yard. The boy said, no, but I ain't lost. <laughs> there are lots of things we don't know. There are lots of things we don't know. But if we have faith in Christ, we aren't lost. Now, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13... And he says, now we see but a poor reflection in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully. You know, church friends, there are many things that we, that we don't know. Especially when it comes to the Bible, to the word of God. But there is coming a day when we will fully understand and if we will have the, the faith and we'll be there that morning with Jesus and you'll spend that, that millennium with him in heaven, you will get to fully understand everything. And friends, life is a mystery for us right now. And we have many unanswered questions. We are perplexed but not in despair. Now, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8, he said that, that we are perplexed but not in despair. Even though we don't know everything, we aren't discouraged or feeling lost. Someday when we see Christ, everything will become so clear. 
But meanwhile, we can relax knowing that God is in control. We have a purpose. We have purpose and direction in life that comes from him, from God. One amazing thing about the word of God, and uh, in studying our lesson this week, I find that one amazing thing about the word of God is how he can use, that God can use almost anything as his object lesson. And like solving a, a great puzzle, And, uh, and he likes to, to, uh, to, to use these, these objects, whether it be nature or people. He likes to use these to, uh, to paint this picture, like I said, like a puzzle. And it becomes clearer and clearer as we study the Bible. And get to know him more and stand, spend time studying his word. And we can clearly see and realize that it is all connected. That many of these Bible writers and characters were born in different periods of time. But sometimes a hundred years apart or many more years apart. So there is no way... They know each other, but they are all talking about the same things. Yeah. Using the same illustrations, uh, illustrations and object lessons. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes they themselves are the object lessons, and they don't even know. God is using all of them whether they like it or not, whether they realize it or not. God is used them as... I would say a canvas to paint this great picture of who he is. And I believe he is still painting to this very day. And you, my dear friends, by simply being here today means you are also part of that great painting that God is painting on his canvas. Isn't that cool? Today, we will look at a well-known object in the Bible that God uses to teach us some lessons of who God is and what his plans are. Now, in the Bible, God is often described as a rock. Now, there are many verses in the Bible that describe or compares God to a rock. I went through our, uh, the Strong's Bible uh, uh, Concordance, and there's almost like two pages of just verses, text after text, of how God is mentioned as a rock, or described as a rock. So I chose just a few to, uh, so, uh, for us to reflect on today. Now, back in these Bible times, a rock is, is very much considered one of the strongest and solid materials that is naturally available in their form in their normal daylights. Right? It is used as building materials for cooking, used as weapons, as road materials, and many other things. Now, it's a common object that people know very well. So God used it as an object for his people to know and understand him. And I find that so amazing. Now let me give you some example. Now in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4, God is said to be the rock. He says, he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice. Righteousness and upright is he. But my point is, he is the rock. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. What comes to your mind if someone is being compared to a rock-like character? Strong, solid, hard, steady, unwavering, maybe majestic, powerful, Here's another example. 
In the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verse 17 to 22, it says, and this is in which God used the rock to describe his plan of salvation. And this happened in an awesome but unique conversation that Moses had with God. I would like to read this conversation to you. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. So this is God speaking. And he said, Moses, please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and leave. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on that rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock. And I will cover you by my hand while I pass you by. Now as I read that, I've read it many times and I know most of you have read that verse many times. I really tried to think and meditate on it. What is God trying to say here? Now friends... This is a story of the assurance of redemption and salvation for someone who chooses to walk in God's ways. Okay, let me try and break it down so we can digest that a little. God tells Moses that he knows Moses' name. And of course, God knows Moses' name because he chose him ever since he was a baby. Right? We all know the story of Moses. And he has been working with Moses this whole time, ever since he was a baby. So, of course, he knew Moses. So what is God trying to say here? He is saying, Moses, I know your character inside and out. I know your struggles, issues, hardships, whatever they may be. I know... I know that you have chosen to follow and obey my ways. And because of this, you have found grace in my sight. And I love you for that. Now, that part is the assurance part. God assuring Moses that they have a solid relationship. Which is very important to Moses at this point. So now Moses asks God if he can see his glory. Now... This is a huge ask. This is a huge ask. Imagine him, Moses, a human being, asking God to see his glory, to see God. God knew that this ask is huge and a little bit unrealistic because of Moses' sinful nature. But still, he did not turn Moses' request down. I believe God knew that a big issue we humans face because of our fallen human nature is that longing and assurance that God will not leave us or abandon us. God knew this. We as fallen beings have separation anxiety. So he, God, told Moses, here is, here is what I'm going to do, knowing very well that this is very important, very important for Moses to be asking this question. And in building this, relation, this unique relationship between Moses and God. This is what God said. I will let you hear my name. Sorry. I will let you see my goodness pass before you. I don't know how that looked like. But you have to ask Moses and ask God... When you get to heaven. To actually see his goodness pass by. This is not an experience. Moses himself is seeing the goodness of God passing. Then I will let you hear my name. I will allow you to understand the fact that my grace will only be for those whom God chooses to give. And he will be compassionate to those whom he chooses to show compassion. 
Now, I like to imagine God saying, son, I cannot reveal my physical face to you now, but because of your fallen nature, you will not survive seeing me, but I tell you what. And notice what God says. He says, here is a place by me. Here is a place beside me, and you shall stand on the rock. It's interesting that God did not tell Moses, there's a rock, go stand on it. He is saying, here is a a place, a spot beside me, and you stand on the rock. Isn't that interesting? Now, do you realize what God is trying to tell Moses here? He is saying, my friend, my son, I cannot physically show myself to you, but I have something better. Here is a spot beside me that I have reserved for you to stand. And as a matter of fact, the spot is the rock. And you can stand on it. In other words, God is telling Moses, Son, I want you to stand on me. Son, I will carry you all the way. This story does not only end here. God continues to say, in verse 22, he says, So it shall be while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. God is saying, Moses, the very same rock in which you are standing on is the same rock that will hide you, is the same rock that will protect you and is the same rock that will cover you. Church family, how many of you know without a doubt that God has a special rock spot for you to stand beside him? Amen. How many of us would like to stand on that privately reserved rock spot. Choose to wholeheartedly obey God and he will let you stand on the rock while he protects you. Choose to stand on that rock so God can hide you in the cleft. Choose to stand on the rock so God can cover you. All we have to do, all you and I have to do is choose. Choose him. And he will do all that. 2 Samuel chapter 22 verse 2 says, And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. God is once again described as a rock here. 2 Samuel chapter 22 verse 47 says, The Lord leaves Blessed be my rock. And 2 Samuel chapter 23 verse 3 says, The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Let me jump to the story of Jacob in Exodus 28. I want you to follow with me. This is a well-known story that we all know. Jacob is running away. He he has just stole his brothers, his older brother's possession, or right, birthright. He has crossed Beersheba and on his way towards Haran. But as he was on his way to Haran, the night caught up on him, so he decided he was going to sleep there. He is tired, he must be hungry, but most of all, he just needs to rest. He has been walking for a long time. He uses whatever light he still has that evening to find a stone that he can use as a pillow. I would like to think that he must have chosen a stone that is a little bit smoother than the others. Raise your hands if you have ever used a stone to sleep on. 
Never? Oh man, I have had my share of using stones to sleep on. It's not that comfortable, no. <laughs> right? But if you are trying to sleep in the jungle where everything else is smooshy and bugs crawling around, a good solid spot, even as uncomfortable as a stone, is much better. And if it's a smooth stone or smooth rock, way better, much better. So I can understand Jacob in this wilderness is getting dark and he's trying to move around, trying to find the smoothest, trying to feel the smoothest stone that he can put his head on and at least have some rest at night. He took the, he found the smooth stone. He He found the, the perfect spot for this stone, lay his head down against it, and fell asleep. Okay, as he fell asleep, he dreamt, and in his dream, he saw a long ladder, the base of which was on the earth, in his, this is in his dream, and the, this long ladder stretched all the way up to heaven, and the top of it reached heaven. At the very top of the ladder, he saw the Lord Standing. Then the Lord spoke to him and told him that he is going to give him that land, that very land that he was lying on. That he will live, that he will have countless descendants, and that the Lord will bless the whole earth through him. That is a lot of promise that God gave this man. Then God told him that he will protect him wherever he goes. Now, Jacob woke from his sleep and realized that God has just spoken to him. And in his realization of what had happened, he felt afraid and acknowledged that God is in that place and he did not know it. So he said, this place is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. That is what Jacob said. The next morning, he woke up and took that rock that which he used as the pillow last night, poured some oil on it, and he anointed it. And he set it up straight as a memorial to God's house. Now, in other words, that rock became a symbol of God's sanctuary and his dwelling place. Church, we, you and I, can worship or pray to God anywhere we like, and we are free to do so. But the sanctuary, like this building here, is a place where the mighty rock dwells. Therefore, it is sanctified as a holy place. God's dwelling place. Take some time to think about that. That you are actually in a sanctuary, a place that is sanctified, set apart, and made holy, dedicated to the mighty rock himself. This is why we treat this old building with the utmost respect. Because this is an anointed place that is set aside for God. This is why we come to worship in this church building. To be in the presence of God. You can worship at home. You can watch a worship a sermon on your internet or TV. That is great. But this is where the mighty rock dwells. You have to be here with your head against the rock to receive this special spiritual blessing. God did not tell Moses to stand on a patch of dirt. Or told Moses, Moses, go climb on that uh, small tree or stand on that branch. Or go stand on that small bush or patch of grass. He specifically told Moses to stand on the rock. To stand 
in his presence. Beside him. And church, come and stand in the presence of God. You have to be standing beside him and he holding you in order for him to reveal himself to you. Wouldn't you like that? Now let me jump to another story that Joshua wrote. Now, Joshua chapter 4. There's a big line, a caravan of people. Ready to cross the Jordan River. The Levites were all holding the Ark of the Covenant. They started walking into the Jordan River. And as they walked, imagine... The water started drying up, started separating. And they went and stood right in the middle of the Jordan. And the Israelites started going down, crossing the Jordan on dry land. Now, everyone had crossed the Jordan River. Then the Lord told Joshua to appoint 12 men and go down into the Jordan River where the Levites were standing and pick up a stone, each of the 12 men, and carry it to the other side of the river on dry ground where they will be camping. So the 12 men walked before the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant and each one of them picked up a stone from the middle of the river and carried it to the other side on dry land. Now, the question, what is the purpose of these 12 stones? Verse 6 and 7 of Joshua chapter 4 says, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. What is God trying to teach the children of Israel by using these stones? Now church, God... Here, in this case, once again, uses a stone to point to the redemption and salvation. Redeeming them from slavery, to, from Egypt, and setting them free in the land he has promised them. Now church, it is easy to remember God in times of hardship. It is easy to remember God in times of hardship. And forget him in the times when we have plenty. The times when we are not struggling. When everything is going smooth. Very easy to forget God. Imagine a boat. The water has come. No storm. No huge waves. God is sitting way at the back. But when the days it is stormy, we bring God and put him right in front. It is easy to do that to God many times. So it is important, notice this, it is very important to teach the children or the younger generations to remember what God has done for you, for your family, for them. It is very important. Verse 20 through 24 says, And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set, set up in Gilgal. Then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask your fathers in the time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. As the Lord your God did to the Red Sea. Which he dried up before us until he had, we had crossed over. 
that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This is the point of God instructing this uh, Joshua to instruct his 12 men to bring the 12 stones from the, from the river to remind this younger generation. God wants us to know him. God wants to build a relationship with you and me. He wants the future generations to know him for their good and benefit. It is our duty to teach the young men, the young people, to fear God. That is our duty as older people, to teach the younger generation. It is our duty to answer their questions and point them to the mighty rock, which is God. When you see a church building, this is the question. When you see a church building, what comes to your mind? Just any church building, what comes to your mind? Worship. Now, it is sad to say that many people seek Christian church buildings today as a reminder of all their hurt. Many see the church as a symbol of something that should be destroyed. To many, the church buildings stand for something that is negative and vile, that they do not want to associate themselves with any of it. Church, we have to help people understand that this sanctuary is a memorial that God is present here. That God is present here. In the darkest part of the night, A ship's captain cautiously piloted his warship through the fog-shrouded waters. With straining eyes, he scanned the hazy darkness, searching for dangers lurking just out of sight. His worst fears were realized when he saw a bright light straight ahead. It appears to be a vessel on the collision course to his ship. To avert the disaster, he quickly radioed the oncoming vessel. This is Captain Jeremiah Smith. His voice crackled over the radio. Please alter your course 10 degrees south, over. Appalled at the audacity of the message, Sorry. To the captain's amazement, the foggy image did not move. Instead, he heard back on the radio. Captain Smith, this is Private Thomas Johnson. Please alter your course 10 degrees north. Over. Appalled at the audacity of the message, the captain shouted back over the radio. Private Johnson, this is Captain Smith. I order you to immediately alter your course 10 degrees south, over. A second time, the oncoming light did not budge. With all due respect, Captain Smith, came the private's voice again. I order you to alter your course immediately 10 degrees north, over. Angered and frustrated, that this impudent sailor would endanger the lives of his men and crew. The captain growled back over the radio. Private Johnson, I can have you court-martialed for this. For the last time I command you on the authority of the United States government to alter your cause 10 10 degrees to the south. I am a battleship. 
The private's final transmission was chilling. Captain Smith, sir, once again, with all due respect, I command you to alter your course 10 degrees to the north. I am a lighthouse. Many of us in today's world have little respect for authority. We operate as if rules can be or should be changed to fit our personal needs and desires. Almost everywhere we turn nowadays, someone is trying to tell you, have it your way. When in reality, we can't always have it our way. We have to conform our lives to a higher truth, a higher authority, which is the word of God. God's truth is like a lighthouse. It's not going to change to accommodate us. We are the ones who must change to conform our lives to what God wants for us. Jesus is also like a lighthouse. The Bible teaches that in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and will be the same forever. He will always be there for us. He is absolutely dependable. Now, church family, like Moses, choose God. Allow him to reveal his glory to you and allow God to stand by your side. Allow God to cover you. Stand on that rock, which is God, which is Jesus. Like Jacob, realize that God wants to live in your heart. Realize that God wants to make you a memorial of him. For him. God wants to use you as his symbol. God wants you to be his ambassador. So that when people are passing outside, they will know that this is where God dwells. Like the Israelite story in Joshua. God wants to use you as a tool to teach people of what it truly means to be set aside as holy to God. And it is my prayer that God will bless us with these lessons. I invite you to please close your eyes and bow your heads for a word of prayer. To the most holy place in heaven, our gracious Father. Thank you for speaking to us today in your word. Father, we learn from these stories that we have read and heard over and over again in our lives, but still teaches us great lessons for us. Thank you for reminding us, Father, once again, that you are an awesome God. That you care for us. That you care for our salvation. And Father, this morning, I pray for your people that are seated in this sanctuary. Father, we are just weak human beings. We fall short. We ask for your presence. We ask for your strength to be in our hearts so that we can fight this battle that we are fighting in this world. Count us, Father as your child. And I pray that you will bless your people that are seated in the sanctuary today. That whatever burdens they carry, the issues that they carry, the sadness, the deep sadness that they have in their hearts, that you will show them that you love them, Father. And give them the assurance that one day all this sinfulness will be over, will be gone. And you will make everything new. And we will live with you forever. Father, I pray that you will bless each and every one of us. Thank you for the beautiful Sabbath day. And we ask all these things in Jesus' mighty name. 
Amén.